Well, good morning, First Baptist Church. I want to welcome you to a very special and very unique day here at First Baptist Church of Opelika because it is snowing here. Yes! Wow, we, we've, we've gone Pentecostal over snow. Uh, you know, normally at this time when kind of I, I welcome those that are guests and visitors, even those of us that have been members for a long time alike, you know, I kind of reference the fact that for every one of us who is seated in the room, there's typically over time about two individuals who watch online. Well, today for every one of us, there's going to be 85 uh, that are watching online uh, because it is Alabama. They saw snow and said, I'm very grateful for the media ministry at First Baptist Church of Opelika. So for the guys and gals that are behind the cameras tonight, today, thank you guys because you're making what's happening here available not only in snowy Opelika, but the entire world. So for those of you that are here on campus and you have braved the snow, welcome, welcome, welcome. If by chance you happen to be a guest or visitor, we do have a reception afterwards. We would love the privilege of getting to know you face to face, give you a little uh, token of our appreciation, uh, give you some snow chains to get back home, whatever it is that you need here. But for those of you that are watching online, what a blessing. Whether you're in snowy Opelika, Alabama, or you're on the other side of the world, however and wherever the Lord has you today, thank you so much uh, that you have joined us. This is a special day uh, because this is kind of the culmination of Disciple Now weekend. In fact, the stage looks a little different today. Don't panic. Uh, Most of this and all of this is for 11 o'clock today where they're going to have their final service kind of wrapping up the weekend. But we have the privilege, and I'll introduce him more in a moment. We have the privilege of having our own student pastor uh, with us today to bring God's Word. It's going to be a wonderful day, wonderful day of worship. Grateful you're here in person. Grateful you're watching us online. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, today, Lord, we know that in our flesh, the the environment around us is so much different than what we're used to. But God, today, we relish in the fact that you made it clear in your word that you are God and you change not. So, Lord, whatever is the circumstances of life, the situations of life, or even the weather of life, God, we rejoice today. That it doesn't change who you are and your purpose for our lives. So God, today, we truly seek uh, that you would revive us. God, that you would uh, redirect us if necessary. Lord, that if you would spark the flame in our hearts if necessary. God, today, may we yield ourselves to you so that you might have your perfect work in us. It is in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Stand and sing, revive us again. We praise Thee, O God, for the Son of Thy love, Lord Jesus, who died and is now born apart. Hallelujah, thunder glory, hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, thunder glory, revive us again. Our glory and praise. me. Mm-hmm. 
His cleansing power revealing How He made the lame to walk again And caused the blind to see And then I cried, dear Jesus Come and heal my broken spirit And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory sing it out now oh victory in jesus my savior forever he sought me and bought me with his free blood he loved me
Things he has. 
the opportunity to come and, and worship. Father, I thank you that we can pray to a almighty, holy God. Father, I thank you that even though the weather is um, deteriorating outside, Father, there's comfort in your home. There's comfort in your love. There's comfort in your word. Father, I thank you the ones that are gathered here. Um, may it be a special moment. Um, may your word touch our hearts, Father, and may we not only be hearers of the word, but doers. Father, I thank you for your grace and your mercy and you give us as, as we take these tithes and offerings. I pray over them, Father, that may me be used to bring somebody to the Father, to your kingdom and to the salvation that you, you offer all of us. These things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. Just when you thought you could somehow outrun him, you chased down by mercy as he proved that nothing his blood can't cover and his arms can't reach to redeem. Oh, just when you thought you exhausted his kindness. His gentle compassion pulls you out of hiding Just when you thought that His grace somehow reached the end You find you're forgiven again It's so amazing how he will move heaven and earth to reach through the darkness, the shame, the heart, and the hurt. And we find out again there is nothing. Savior loves more. Seeing surrender so he can renew and restore. Just when you thought you could somehow outrun, you chased down by mercy. As he proved that nothing his blood can't cover and his arms can reach to redeem. Oh, just when you thought you exhausted his kindness, his gentle compassion pulled you out of hiding. Just when you thought that his grace somehow reached the end you find you're forgiven again he wants you you're never too far and he'll meet you right where you are so don't be afraid don't turn away from his love. Just when you thought it's 
exhausted in his kindness, his gentle compassion pulled you out of hiding just when you thought that his grace somehow reached the end. You find you're forgiven again. Well, speaking of coming and being very forthright and honest before the Lord, where you're seated this morning, where you're watching online, this place all weekend was a place where over 300 teenagers gathered in multiple services, not only to worship together, uh, but to hear challenges from the Word of God. In just a moment, uh, you have a very special treat this morning. We're going to hear kind of the final Disciple Now message, kind of getting all of us who supported this with prayer financially, kind of kind of hear what the weekend was about. And we're privileged today to have our own Spencer Helm, uh, who's going to be preaching. If you haven't met Spencer yet, uh, he is our new student pastor. Uh, he, is, he grew up and was raised in Georgia, but we found him in Virginia and brought him to Alabama where it snows uh, occasionally. Uh, but he and his wife, Mo, uh, they have little Charlie. their little daughter. And uh, God's just blessed them and not only their lives but their ministry. And I'm sure he'll share that with you. But we're excited uh, that he's with us to share with us uh, about what the Lord is doing, not just in our student ministry but what happened here at Disciple Now Weekend and to challenge us as well. But before he does, I think it does us well uh, to know the extent of what this building can be used for. We're about to see a quick video of what D-Now Weekend looked like, not just in this room. And I know, for the sake of just fun, it's the 8.30 service. How many of you remember playing basketball in what used to be the gym, the now 316 center? Got some old basketball guys, all right. Any of y'all roller skate in there back in the day? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Ice skating. Just watch this video. You have shown me what freedom means. I'm alive, your grace has covered me. I'm gonna sing your praises. One, two, three, jump! Fuck it up! Get those hands up! Old chains don't have a hold on me. The surrender feels heavenly. It goes beyond. Get tired of singing up. Never get tired of singing your love. Sing! Oh, 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 oh. I never get tired. Never get tired. Come on! Oh, 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 oh. I never get tired. Never get tired of singing your love. Two chains and you're made and good. What a joy to be loved. Nothing else could ever do. I'm gonna sing your praises again. I'm gonna sing your praises. What? Cause you are worthy and you will always be enough. And I will never get tired of singing up. Singing your love. Whoa. Never get tired. You sing. Never get tired. Never get tired. One more time. Come on. I never get tired. I never get tired. You sing. Never get tired. Never get tired. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. We had an incredible time this weekend. 
Um, and we just want to say, first of all, thank you, because you as a church, you make something like that happen. And so you made it possible for um, 300 people to go ice skating in the 316 uh, Center last night. Uh, man, this weekend was incredible. And I'm going to tell you all about what God did in just a moment. But I just wanted to uh, take a quick second and uh, just pray. And then I'll introduce myself and we'll hop into God's Word again. So let's pray. Dear Jesus, we love you. Uh, God, we thank you for your word. It's living, it's active, it's powerful, it changes our lives. And so, Lord, I thank you that I'm gathered in this room together this morning with everyone in here whose lives have been changed by the gospel of your son and the word of your power. So, Lord, would you just let your word go out this morning? God, I pray that you would let everyone see your son, Jesus, and hide me behind the cross, Lord. Let your word come out and let your purpose change our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, we had a, a great uh, weekend this weekend, and it's an honor that Pastor Jeff uh, asked me to be up here to share this morning. My name is Spencer Helm. Uh, you might have seen my wife and I and our daughter about seven months ago when we first moved here from Virginia um, when we got voted in. Uh, my daughter was probably like uh, squiggling trying to get on my wife's arm on the stage. You know, she's two and a half. She's a lot of fun. Um, my wife and I have been together since 2018. I've been doing full-time ministry since 2012, so we're going on 10 years now. Um, and uh, the Lord saved my life and changed me in 2009. So it's been an incredible ride. Uh, we've been in Virginia for the past uh, 10 years doing ministry there. Um, and then the Lord in his gracious plan called us here to Opelika, Alabama this summer. And it's just been an incredible ride, an inc incredible blessing. Um, we're so thankful for the church that's here. We're so thankful for the family that we've experienced. One of the things that we prayed about, if the Lord was going to move us, we are, uh, one of our biggest prayer requests is that the Lord would, would bring us from one family to another. We wanted to be in community. We wanted people uh, who we could raise our children with. We wanted people that we could learn from, and we wanted people we could teach. And so um, I mean, God just gave us everything and so much more. And the student ministry, let me just tell you that. I don't know what you guys uh, put in the water here, but the student ministry at First Baptist Church of Opelika is incredible. Uh, I walked in to an amazing student ministry. Uh, Taylor McQueen, Owen, uh, and A.B., they are part of our team. They'll be in here just later. But they've been leading the team along Dan Strickland for years, and the Lord has just blessed and grown the students, not just numerically, but, but deep spiritually. And so we got to see an overflow of that this weekend. So um, if you weren't here this weekend, we did D-Now, it's Disciple Now weekend. And uh, there's uh, one really big takeaway that I think I wanted to share with you guys this morning. Um, and uh, the, my, my opening one-liner is this. As the church, our words are how, about, are how people hear about the gospel. As the church, the words that we share about Jesus are, are how people hear about the gospel, right? Uh, Paul says it's, it's uh, through the word of God, by faith, you know, in, in hearing the word of God, that someone can come to the knowledge of salvation. We've got to hear the gospel to, share, to, to be able to lead someone to Christ, right? So our words are how people hear about the gospel. But it's by our actions as a church that people experience the gospel, right? So there's one way that I could get up here and I could teach the word of God and you can hear about what Jesus has done for you and his death and his resurrection from the grave, right? But there's another thing that you can experience when I live life among you and I let Jesus live through me and you experience his love. And so that's what I wanted to really talk about this morning because we're looking in Colossians and we're about to hop in there in just a second. But it was through uh, the, the, the word of the gospel that I believed and was saved, but it was through the people who loved Jesus around me, living their lives in light of his love and loving me that changed my life forever in 2009. And so I'm thankful for that. Man, as we go into this morning, uh, one other thing that I want you to hold on to and think about is this, this phrase right here. It's Jesus shows us another way. Uh, I have, like I said, a two and a half year old daughter. Um, she is currently in the art phase. She loves everything crayons, markers, and paint, right? And that's a beautiful thing. So I'm, I'm watching her paint for the first time. I'm like, man, she's going to be a famous artist one day, right? And then five minutes later, there's paint all over the wall in the house. Like, I wish she would have never, ever touched that paint because we don't have enough uh, magic erasers to make this house look the same as it used to. Um, but uh, it was so funny. I remember the first day we broke out that paint in that paintbrush. She was sitting there in her high chair because that's the safest place for a, a child of her age to paint, right? She can't get to the rest of the walls. We learned that one. Um, but uh, I remember uh, handing her a paintbrush, showing her the paint, right? And she, she had watched us do it before. We gave her a quick preview of what painting was supposed to look like, my wife and I, right? Like, we dip it in there, we're painting, and she's just 
so excited, right? She's watching us. She just like, give me, give me. She wants the brush. And uh, uh, when we give her the brush, she doesn't know how to dip the, the bristles into the paint, right? She doesn't know what to do with it. She watched us do it, but she's never done it before. So she's trying her own way, right? She's like slamming the paintbrush on the little paint tins right there. She's trying to get it onto the paper. She's playing with it in her hands. And so um, we, we let her try and figure it out for a minute. And then we just, we stepped in and, and, and guided her. We helped her a little bit. We showed her another way of learning to paint, right? When I got married, uh, my wife showed me uh, how to live in a lot of other ways, right? Uh, uh, before I got got married, um, I never had a squeegee in the shower to clean off the, uh, the, the shower door when I got out, right? I didn't know that, that people did that, but my wife showed me another way, right? Before I got married, um, I thought good budgeting was just saving money and not trying to spend every paycheck, right? My wife showed me another way. There's another way to do things. There's another way to live life, and I'm thankful for that help. And I would just say those are two topics. She's helped me in so many ways. She makes my life so much better, and I couldn't do it without her. Um, but, but sometimes it's good to learn uh, about things in another way. And that's where I wanted to go this morning. Um, in just a minute, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about my story. Um, but what happened here this weekend, I don't want to move past that quite yet. It was incredible. Uh, as Pastor Jeff said, we had um, over uh, 300 people in this room all weekend long. And I just say, I'm tired but I'm thankful to be here this morning. It's kind of like that when you're young on Christmas morning, like you wake up super early, even earlier than your parents, and you never do that. And you're really excited and you're tired at the same time, but it feels so good and so right. That's, I think that's what me and the student staff and the students are experiencing this morning. We're so thankful for what God did. Um, this weekend, uh, the theme of RD now was the word hidden. And the reason why we chose that, the team and I were praying uh, over uh, what God wanted to speak and what we could build for this weekend. And uh, uh, he directed us to Colossians uh, chapter 3. And so we walked through the book of Colossians chapter 3 this weekend. And so on Friday, uh, we learned, the first thing we learned about was that uh, we have died. Like if we are in Christ, we have died and our lives are now hidden with Christ in God. That word hidden pops out right there, right from verse 3 uh, of chapter 3. And so on Friday night, we talked about the, the new identity that Jesus gives us as believers. And we had to uh, come to this realization that if you are in Christ, your old life is dead. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, right? If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Therefore, um, the, uh, the old is gone and everything has become new, right? And so uh, we're looking at these same ideas in Colossians in chapter 3. Verse 3 says, if uh, you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And we wanted to, to share with the students that night about what that meant for their lives. That their identity is not only about themselves, but their identity is hidden in Christ. Their identity becomes centered on Christ and who he is. And as they continue to grow in their walk and in their faith with the Lord, um, there should be this gradual growing where people can't see where, where Jesus starts and they stop in their own lives, right? There's this divine entanglement that, that we are with Jesus, he abides in us, we in him, and so when people see us, they're also experiencing who he is through our love and through our faith. So we talked about our identity the first night. We came back on Saturday morning or Saturday afternoon, I'll say at 12 o'clock, and uh, uh, we learned about uh, sin. And uh, we look all the way back to Genesis 3 in the garden, and we see that uh, this theme of hiding is all over Scripture, right? Um, in, in, in chapter 3 of Genesis, right, after Adam and Eve, after they rebelled, after they transgressed, and they ate the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that they weren't supposed to eat of, what was the first thing that they did? Their response was to hide. They got fig leaves and they covered themselves. They wanted to hide from their nakedness. And then they wanted to hide from God in the, in the garden in the cool of the day. And the first thing that the Lord asks as he walks through is, hey, uh, who, who told you? What, what, what have you done? Where are you guys at? They're, they're hiding from him, right? And so uh, we see uh, that this thing called sin and its power in our lives, one of its first responses or one of the things that it, it grows a desire in us to do is as we live in it, we want to hide. Right? Sin comes along with shame, and, and shame comes along with fear, and fear comes along with, with hiding. And so that morning we talked to the students about, we don't know where you're at in your life or your walk with Christ right now, but we just want to let you know, if, if you're giving into sin in your life, it's pulling you away from the life that Jesus has from you. It's, it's making you want to hide from all that God's calling you into. God doesn't want you to hide from him. He wants you to hide 
in him. And then the last uh, thing that we talked about last night was um, that, that God is this picture all through Scripture that he's our refuge uh, in our fortress. In Psalms 91, uh, 1 and 2, it says this. He who dwells in the shelter, that word shelter, dwell in the shelter of the Most High, will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God, in whom I trust. Uh, I, I love that picture right there because God all through the Bible uh, presents himself as a hiding place to his people. When the storms of life come in, Jesus talks about listening to his words like building a house upon the rock. What do you do in a house? You take refuge from the storm. And so we know that our identity is in Christ, that sin calls us, to, wants us to hide from the Lord, but God calls us to, to run into him and to be our refuge and fortress. And that's where we kind of go into this morning is that uh, with our lives hidden in Christ, we also have an outward thing that we do. We have actions and responsibilities that we're called to in the gospel. And the last tagline we had is, uh, your, your identity is hidden in Christ, so your faith doesn't have to be, right? Like the Lord, uh, his identity, who he's called me to be, is all that I need to be concerned on. So I can go out without fear of what man can do. I can go out without fear of insecurity because I know that God is my refuge. And at the end of the day, I do what he says and I am who he says that I am. And so that's where we got to. Um, and, and so the, the, the line that I gave you earlier, right, as the church, the, uh, our words are how people hear the gospel. And as a church, our actions are how people experience the gospel. And so I, I get really passionate about this because this is where my life changed those years ago. Uh, I grew up in Georgia, as Pastor said. Uh, my family had me in church every single Sunday. My mom and dad, as, as, as long as I can remember, I can wake up, get ready for school, and I would see my dad in his uh, chair at 6 o'clock in the morning reading his Bible, doing his quiet time, praying for, for me, for his children, for his family. Right? That, there was a, a, a heritage of that in our family. Right? My, my parents did what they were supposed to. They brought me to church. But there's something still broken about my heart. Like it's, it's very true. We know that all of us are born into sin. And until we come to Christ uh, with our own decision in our own faith, salvation doesn't happen, right? And so uh, for me, I played the church game for years. I would sit on a pew just like this on a Sunday morning. I listened as the, the hymns were saying. I listened as the pastor preached. And then I would leave and go about my daily life. In fifth grade, uh, I can remember there's a turning point there. I started uh, gr uh, having this growing desire to really want to be popular, right? Um, my dad was always a goofball. He's super funny. He can make anyone laugh. He'll talk to anyone. It doesn't matter if he knows you for 10 years or if he just met you on the side of the street in a 7-Eleven, right? And so I think that some of that rubbed off on me. And in fifth grade, I started getting attention because I was the class clown, right? Um, I started acting up and, and people would laugh at that. And all of a sudden, like, oh, approval, approval, approval. I'll, I want more of that, right? It almost became like a drug in that sense. Is I, it feels good when people recognize me. And so I started forgetting a lot of the values that my parents had taught me because they didn't get me as much approval from my peers as acting up in class did, right? And so that was a big turning point for me. And I really stopped uh, uh, respecting my authority well. I really stopped uh, 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 trying to live out the things that my parents had taught me to. I went down my own path. I wanted to be my own person. I wanted to be a rebel without a cause, right? And so going into middle school, uh, that one compromise, that one set of decisions in fifth grade started leading me down a trajectory that I had no clue where it would take me. And I remember uh, in middle school, more of that acting out happened, more getting in trouble. Um, but I also started making conscious decisions and efforts to hang out with a different crowd of people. I stopped hanging out with the people that I'd grown up with. I stopped hanging out with the guys and girls that I'd grown up going to church with. Um, and I started hanging out with people who were known for not getting, uh, not, not uh, always being in trouble, right? I was known, uh, I was hanging out with people who were known uh, for uh, being in the principal's office, known for not being in school when they're supposed to, known for not doing well in school, whatever it might be. I was hanging out with that group of people because I started seeking that approval and I was getting more and more and more. And so I just took it to the extreme. I think that my life has always been extremes. Well, whatever direction I'm going in currently is the one that I'm 100% in with, right? And so in middle school, more and more compromise, more and more uh, 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 just bad influences rubbing off on my life. And getting to high school, I remember in ninth grade, I went to my first uh, high school party. And uh, that, that night I started drinking. Just a couple months later, I went to more parties. And I started uh, smoking marijuana, doing drugs, and that became a normal part of our life. And, uh, um, and as I go into high school, that becomes even more of this identity. I, I want to be the rebel without a cause, right? I, I, I want to be the one, just like all the kids that are older than me, I want to be like when the senior
seniors at the party scene. I want to be drinking. I want to be known for being rough and ready, ready to go, right? And so uh, my, my life is just heading in this trajectory. I had no clue where it would take me. I thought it would give me everything that I ever wanted in life. I thought it would make me happy because temporarily sin felt good for that season, right? Um, and, and, and all through high school, these, these habits, these addictions, these actions, they're just repeating more frequently. They're getting worse and worse and worse. And by the time I was a senior in high school, um, I was fully addicted to prescription painkillers. Uh, there was a girl in one of my classes, and she would take entire bottles from her grandparents who she lived with. And I would, just being honest with you, that, that's where it all really started for me. And I remember a couple months into my senior year, I didn't have any of this medicine, and I started feeling really sick, and I knew that moment that, that I was hooked on that. I said, oh, well, I shook it off. Everything was good. I wasn't paying any consequences at the moment. A um, couple months later, my, my best friend, he was a great dude. He was, uh, my brother, um, man, he always looked out for me. He was a big guy. Uh, he was like 6'3", 6'4", uh, 250 pounds. He played uh, for the varsity football team. His name was Chris. He was my big brother. We did everything together. Got a phone call from him one day that they'd found a, uh, a tumor in his colon. And he didn't know what was going to happen, but they said it was the size of a baseball. And they were going to have to operate really soon. They needed to see if it was cancerous. It ended up being stage four cancer when they found it. He was 18 years old. Um, and a, a couple months later, my best friend passed away. And I kind of hit a, a tipping point in that moment. I was broken. I was sad. I was asking questions. How, how could a, a good God do something like this. I, I, those are the moments when I was uh, praying. I haven't prayed in years, but, you know, one of my friends is about to go down, so I'll start throwing up prayers left and right. I'll change if you heal him, whatever it might be, right? And then I'll, in, in my mind, I was let down. And I used that hurt as leverage to continue on in my selfishness. I used it to self-medicate. I used it to continue in my addiction. My life just spiraled out of control. I began to hurt everyone around me. Uh, addiction is not easy to contain. It, it gets messy really fast, and, and your sin doesn't just hurt you. It hurts the people around you who love you the most. And in August of 2009, my whole world fell apart. I hit rock bottom. Um, I had some good and faithful uh, people in my community that uh, knew that something was going on and they were going to get to the bottom of it, not because they wanted to get me in trouble, but because they wanted to get me out of whatever I was going through. Um, got caught stealing a bunch of stuff. Got all that forgiven, praise God. They didn't have to send me to jail. But I had a, a choice in that moment. I said, you can either go to court, we'll take you to court, and uh, you can do the time for the things that you've done. You know, I was just, I was an 18-year-old guy at this point. I was shaking in my boots. And, uh, um, and uh, they said, or you can go get help. And so I'm like, I'm going to choose the second option. That sounds way better than, than going to prison or going to jail, whatever it might be. And uh, in my mind, always taking the easy way out, right? Um, what I didn't know is that my parents had been talking to people who uh, ran a nonprofit Christian rehab uh, in North Carolina that was all about discipleship, that was all about Jesus Christ. And it was a year long. I thought I was going to go somewhere for 30 days like most of my other friends who got in trouble, right? They dropped me off a couple weeks later. I'm sick as a dog. I'm detoxing from everything in my life. My life is rock bottom. No one wants to talk to me. Everyone's found out of how bad of a friend that I was. And I get dropped off in this place called Sand Hills, North Carolina. And a bunch of uh, Christians come and open the doors and they bring me and they welcome me. They tell me about what I'm about to do for the next year. I think my life is going to be over one year. You know, I, was, I, was, I just turned 19 at this point. And so I'm just thinking like, man, what, what's going to happen? My life is going to be gone in, in a year, right? Um, this whole time as I'm in that program, they're telling me uh, with their words about the gospel of Jesus, that Jesus has a plan for my life, right? And I'm, and I'm sitting there thinking of how could Jesus love someone like me? I was in church my whole life, and I turned my back on him. I knew the truth. Most of my friends had never been to church, but I, but I knew what was right, and I still did what was wrong. And I, and I kept running from Jesus even in that space. But their persistency of, of sharing the gospel with me and helping me to experience the gospel, the love of Jesus through their actions on a daily basis, it changed everything about me. I remember I sat up in a chapel service one day. It was about three months into it. And they said, hey, if you need to give your life to Jesus, I want you to stand up this morning and I want you to say that you are giving your life to Jesus. And every, every bone in my body is shaking. It's that moment where like, I, it's my turn. I know that Jesus is calling me. I believe it. I've seen it. I see it in these people's lives. I'm experiencing his love. And I have faith right now to know that he hasn't given up on me. And that morning I stood up and my life was never the same. 
They continued to walk with me for the next three years. I, I graduated the program, and I went back to work there for three years and uh, just help other guys who had come uh, out of the places that I had come out. They discipled me. That's where I began ministry before I went off to college to get a degree. And uh, their words and their actions changed my broken heart. I was a confused, young, teenage male. Whole life was burning down. I was angry. I was upset at myself. I was embarrassed. I had so many problems. You can just list them off. It was a problem. I had it. But people were patient with me. They not only told me that Jesus loved me, they showed me that Jesus loved me through their hearts, their words, and their actions. And so uh, that's where we get into Colossians chapter 3. If, you got, if you're there, look at verse 12 real quick. And we're getting towards the end, but, but I just wanted to set up a, a case for how powerful not only our words for the gospel are, but our actions. I had people for years walk alongside of me and show me what it, what it meant to follow Jesus. I learned how to be patient because people were patient with me. I learned not how, how to be humble, not because they wanted to humble me all the time because I was prideful, but, but they were humble with me. I learned how to love because I saw them not only talk about God's love, but I saw godly people love in ways that I had never experienced before. And in Colossians 3, 12 through 15, it says this, or through 14, I'm sorry. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. Paul's writing this in verse 14. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And I love these verses because it's a, it's a, it's a marching order for us as believers. If we, if we ask ourselves how to be uh, Christians and, and how to live the way that Jesus has called us to, we can just go to these verses. It makes it very clear. Paul shows us what the new life that Christ has uh, given us looks like. He says, put on then. Like it's a, a, some a type of wardrobe. Put on the things that Christ died and rose again to give you. And, and we could say, well, yeah, Paul was pretty good at this, right? He was, he was compassionate. Uh, he had kindness and humility and meekness in his life. But, but really all this goes back to is in these verses, this is exactly who Jesus was. The last thing that really changed my life when I met Christ was not only the people sharing his word, not only the people loving me uh, the way his word called me, but, but I had a mentor who said, you're going to learn how to read the Bible. I'd never personally read the Bible before. I didn't know where to start or what to do. He gave me a one-year Bible reading plan. He says, start reading today. He says, if you can do this for a year, I promise you it will change your life. And I did it. I, I'd never done anything for 365 days before in my life. That was the first time, and it changed my life. But here's why. Because the first time I not was just hearing about Jesus from other people, I started seeing him live his life out in Scripture. And the people that he loved, whoa. And the way that he loved them, it's incredible. And the things that he did, I, I never knew. I heard stories like, yes, he fed 5,000 people and he walked on the water. But I didn't know that he stood between a woman who was caught in adultery and an angry mob who was trying to kill her. And he stood up for her life and gave her dignity and grace when no one else would. I didn't know he did that. I didn't know he went down to uh, the woman at the well in Samaria when, when no one else would talk to her. And she'd already been with five men, but, but he told her everything that she had ever done. And he changed her life. And she went out that day and reached her town. For, I didn't know Jesus did things like that. Being in his word changed my life. When I look at Colossians 3, all these virtues that Paul has listed out, they all point to who Jesus is. And the way that he lived his life and the way that he's still living his resurrected life as the King of kings and Lord of lords. But I just want to show you from Colossians 3 real quick. This is a perfect case study for who Jesus was. The first thing that Paul tells us to put on right here is compassionate hearts. It reminds me of Luke 19, 5 through 7. When Jesus came to the place and looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus. Hurry and come down for I must stay at your house today. I think about that word compassionate hearts. Zacchaeus was the most hated person in that town. He was a tax collector. He had uh, frauded people. He had uh, used extortion. People were poor and losing property because of him. But Jesus sees the most hated man in town. He sees little Zacchaeus climbing up a tree just to see him. He says, I'm going to have house at your lunch today. You remember what the result of that compassionate meeting was? Zacchaeus comes out and he says, if I have wronged anybody, I'm going to pay it all back. And Jesus says, truly today that this man is a son of Abraham. He knows the truth, right? Jesus' compassion with the most hated in society is an example of who and what his heart truly is. The next thing that Paul says to put on is kindness. 
In John chapter 4, Jesus answers the woman at the well, if you knew the gift of God and he that is, that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. One of the most famous verses in Scripture talking about living water. And Jesus reveals it to a woman who's sitting by herself at a well, goes there in the middle of the day because she's too embarrassed to be uh, at the watering hole in the normal times of social circles. He gives her grace. And her story is still written in Scripture today. Jesus showed kindness to people that no one else would show kindness to. Humility. Paul says, put on humility. John 19. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. And his soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe to mock him. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him with their hands. Jesus showed humility in this moment. Why? They didn't know that they were assaulting the King of kings and the Lord of lords. The one who spoke the very world and universe into creation. Jesus was humble enough because he knew he had to go to the cross to save the very people who were mocking him in that moment. That's true humility. Looking at the life of Jesus changed everything for us. Meekness, Paul says to put on meekness. In Matthew 27 it says this. Then two robbers who were crucified with him, one on the right, one on the left, and those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. Meekness shows that, that you have the power to do something, but you restrain yourself from doing it, right? Jesus had the power to come down from that cross anytime he wanted. He could have called 10,000 legions of angels to come save him. He was being mocked at the very people he was dying to save. But in that moment, he held on to meekness because he knew when he breathed his final breath on the cross, what he would purchase for all of us was far greater than any temporary glory he could have had for saving himself on that cross. That was meekness. Paul says to put on patience. John 11, Jesus said, take away the stone. And Martha, the sister of Lazarus, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he's been dead for four days. I don't know if you've read this story, but time and time again, as Jesus is getting closer to Lazarus' resurrection in the tomb, they keep saying, Lord, he's already been dead. Lord, I know that he's dead, but even if you want to now, I guess you can make him be alive again. Time after time, Jesus is telling him, didn't I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? Jesus is incredibly patient. Even when Martha is telling him not to roll away the stone because it will smell, she's not thinking about that. He, she's going to get her brother back, but Jesus is still patient. He doesn't say, all right, you messed up. You told me not to do that. Miracle over. I'm going back home. No, in patience, he bears with him, and he raises his friend from the grave and gives him life. Lastly, I'm oh, sorry, two more. Forgiveness. Paul says to put on forgiveness. And when they came to the place that was called the skull, they crucified him. And the criminals on his right and his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. In his last dying breath, Jesus shows forgiveness. He's praying for us. He could have been praying anything else. Lord, Father, help me. This is painful. Father, remember what they're doing. No, he says, Father, forgive them. You see, all these virtues that Paul calls us to put on, he looks back to the one who embodied them perfectly. And it was the way that Jesus lived out his love, and not only his word, but the way he lived out his love that changed people's life. He spoke the word of God to the woman at the well. He spoke the word of God to the woman caught in adultery, but it was also his actions on those days that spoke just as loud as his words. He spoke of forgiveness on the cross, but it was his actions on the cross that showed what forgiveness actually costed. He told people he would rise from the dead, but those were just words at that moment. But he rose from the dead three days later confirming who he was and that every word he spoke was true. The last thing he tells us to put on is love. One of my favorite verses in Romans, and this is love, that while we are sinners, Christ died for us. That's perfect love. While I was in my mess for all those years running from God, Jesus Christ died for me. He loved me even when I was burning down every bridge in the road that I was on. Even when I let down him and so many others, while I was a sinner, Jesus died for me. While we were all in our sin, Jesus died for us. And as we get to the close of this section in Colossians, Jesus is a reminder of who we're called to live up to, his standard. Jesus is, is the bar and the meter for everything that we're supposed to live out when it comes to our faith. The words I said at the beginning is this. It's by our words that people hear the gospel. We're called to go and speak the gospel. We're called as the body of Christ to share 
the gospel. But it's by our actions that people experience the gospel. Right? I could tell you I could bake a great apple pie all day, but until you sit there on, the, on my counter at home and eat it with me, you don't know how good it is, right? It's that experience right there that, that culminates the word that was heard and the, and the experience that was had, right? And so people are going to hear about Jesus through us. And the message that we're giving today to not only this hour right here, but the students who are going to be here, we're commissioning them to live out their faith. But I just wanted to remind you as families in here, as the people who have gone before, so many of our students that are in that building right now over there, it's the way you love alongside of the words that you say that change people's lives. I'm so thankful that I have praying parents. I'm so thankful that I had praying grandparents. I'm so thankful that I have people who are willing to love me when I wasn't easy to love or I wouldn't be here today. I'm so thankful that I had a Savior who is willing to love me when I wasn't easy to love or I wouldn't be here today. That's the power of the body of Christ. We're not only a people that Jesus has died and rose again and forgiven. We're a people empowered and sent out there with a radically different kind of love than the world has ever seen. They didn't like Jesus when he stepped onto the scene because he was different. But the world will know that we belong to him by the way we will love one another. So in this, I'm just going to close in this moment. I thank you for being here this morning on a snowy day in Opelika, Alabama which I heard doesn't happen very often. But thank you for the support you give to our student ministry. Thank you for the example that you set by your love for Christ in their lives. And it's just, if anything, if we could have just more encouragement this morning to remember how much our words and our actions impact the people around us, but also what the standard of that is. It's Jesus. Everything that we see about his life, both then and even now, should push us and pull us to want more and more of that and to live that out. Paul says, put on then as God's people. Our commission today is put on. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we love you. God, we thank you this morning for who you are. Lord, this morning, in this moment, for people uh, who are watching online or in this room, Lord, I pray if there's someone who doesn't know you today, Jesus, that they would surrender their lives to you. Lord, it's uh, said in your word that it's by faith that we can believe. It's by faith that we come to Jesus and it's by confessing with our mouths or our hearts that we're justified. Lord, I pray today that if there's anyone watching online or in here that doesn't know you, that in this moment, that they uh, would believe and know that you could change their lives forever, that you loved someone just like them, that you died for their sins and that you rose again. I pray, Lord, if there's anyone in here today or watching online that needs to take that step, that they would pray something very simple like that with me right now in this moment. Dear Jesus, I give my life to you. I believe you are the Son of God. I ask that you would forgive me of my sins. I believe in everything that you've done. I believe that, that you are the Son of God, that you came from heaven to earth, you became a man, you walked among us, and you lived the life I could never live. Perfect. And you died the death that I deserve to die by my sins on the cross. But I believe also that the grave couldn't hold you, and three days later you rose again to new life. So Jesus, this morning I pray that you would give me new life. I give myself to you. Help me to follow you for all of my days, and help me to show the world who you are. Dear Jesus, I pray for everyone else in this room today, Lord, that we could just be encouraged and reminded that we are the people of God and we are sent out on the mission of God to love like Jesus loved and to share the good word of the gospel that our Savior has given to us. Lord, I pray that you would remind them of just how powerful their impact and their influence and their leadership is, Lord, that they, we would be a church who leads our homes by love, that we would lead uh, the space in our, in our office places by love, that we would lead uh, coaching teams by love, that we would lead on the in and outs everywhere we go when we sit or when we rise by the love of Christ and that we would share the word of Christ. We love you and we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Decision will be right here at the front. Just as I am with thou one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to
just as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blood to thee whose blood can cleanse each spot O Lamb of God I come I come Church family if you'll be seated for just a moment maybe you're one of those individuals as Spencer led kind of in that prayer opportunity. Maybe today's the day you, you pray to prayer in your own words, or maybe today's the day you've got questions, concerns, whatever it may be. I just want you to know that the opportunity to respond has not come to a close. In fact, at the end of the service, to my right, your left, uh, there'll be some folks pretty easily identifiable. We have a guest reception. We'd love the opportunity uh, just to see and to know and to hear what the Lord uh, is doing in your life. In a moment, we're going to have our video announcements, and then um, Paul Dunbar is going to close um, our service today with a benediction. But there's one very important announcement that I have to give before all those announcements. And Mr. Dunbar, it requires your presence. Oh, Yes. I know you didn't. Mr. Dunbar has now joined a very special club. He turned 40 this week. That's right. That's right. So we just wanted to say happy birthday to you, brother. We love you. Happy 40th birthday. And we'll show you where the new vitamins are. <laughs> uh, thanks, Dr. Myers. I appreciate the kind words. Oh, we're showing the video. You did. I'm, I'm shook. Hey First Baptist, my name's Megan and thanks so much for being here today. Children's Choir will begin on Sunday, January 23rd. Children in the third to sixth grade are invited to participate. Rehearsal is at six to seven in the children's building. Students, your worship team will also begin on Sunday, January 23rd. Students in seventh to 12th grade are invited to participate. Rehearsal is on Sunday evenings from five to six in the choir room. Fine Arts Academy registration for spring semester is open. Classes begin Monday, January 24th. For more info, visit our website. The Friend to Friend ministry is reorganizing in 2022. Friend to Friend is volunteers ministering to homebound members in our church family. There will be a planning meeting for those interested in volunteering on January 27th at 11 a.m. in room 137. A light lunch will be served. The mission and vision of this ministry will be shared. Contact Jennifer Johnson to RSVP. Women, Galentine's Game Night is Thursday, February 3rd. You may RSVP beginning today at fpcopalika.com slash women. Men, man church tickets are on sale. Join us Thursday, February 17th with guest speaker Jonathan Evans in worship led by Alan Levi in the worship center. Tickets are $5 and available at fpcopalika.com slash men. Our next parent commissioning service will be March 27th. Please email Cindy Cohen before February 18th if you would like to be a part of this special service. A mandatory parent meeting will be held on February 27th. Make sure to stay connected with us throughout the week. Go to our website at fbcopalika.com and on all social platforms. Join us tonight in the Worship Center at 6 p.m. for evening service. Have a great afternoon. That's a lot. I hope you took notes on that. But if you see Spencer and his student team, tell them again, great job. They crushed it this weekend. Excited to see what God's going to do at 11 o'clock. I want to encourage you, church family, to share the words of Jesus in the gospel and to show the love of Jesus so people will know Christ as their Savior. I'm going to pray for us, and then you guys be safe. I know it's a little different condition, so drive a little slower. Okay, drive like you got a cake in your, in, your, in, in your lap, all right? Let us pray. God, we love you, and we're so grateful for who you are. God, thank you for the message from Spencer today, and God, we just lift up our students. God, we lift up our church, that we would make you known, that we would share the words of Christ, and we would show the love of Christ to make him known. God, us and lead us today. In Christ's name, we pray. Amen. Church family, you're dismissed, and it's still snowing. <laughs>